Hello and welcome to The Nexus. On today's programme, we're focusing on a massive child abuse scandal at English football clubs. A four-year investigation by the Football Association has revealed hundreds of children were sexually abused for decades. The FA started the investigation after former professional footballers revealed to the press how coaches had sexually abused them for years. Two of those players are with us today. Both played for their country. FA Cup winner Paul Stewart and his former Manchester City teammate David White. A long-awaited report has laid bare the extent of historical child abuse in English football. The 710-page report by Clive Sheldon QC covers the years 1970 to 2005 and was commissioned by the FA in 2016. After the former professional footballer Andy Woodward broke his silence and talked about how he was abused by his former youth coach, Barry Burnell. Well, nearly five years on, the report has made it clear that Andy was not alone. It found that at least 692 others had also been abused and noted that the number was likely to be far higher because not everyone would have come forward. It also found that there were at least 240 suspected perpetrators. Where incidents of abuse were reported to people in authority at football clubs, their responses were rarely competent or appropriate. It said that the FA failed to stop two of the most notorious perpetrators, Barry Burnell and Bob Higgins, from being involved in football. However, it concluded that there was no evidence the FA knew of a problem before 1995 and that abuse was not commonplace nor was there any evidence of a paedophile ring. Well, the abuse suffered by Andy, our guests Paul and David and many others is also the subject of a major three-part BBC documentary called Football's Darkest Secret, which has just aired here in the UK. I had some highs in my career. I never enjoyed them because I had this empty soul. It's a dirty secret deep inside you. It's like a stutter, but it's like, even if you want to say it, there's something in your mind that stops you. The reason I can't tell anybody else is for fear of my dad finding out. They all wanted to be footballers. And Paul Stewart and David White join us now. I wanted to start with you, Paul. Seeing this documentary air, the entire nation seeing it, it's all come out in the open. What does it mean to you? Well, it's taken a long time. It's taken some three years uh, with all the trials that were going on in, in the UK with Higgins and, and Benel and, and other legal reasons. It has taken some three years to come to fruition. Um, I think it's a fair, it's a fair production of, of what happened to us as children. Um, I think it depicts an awful lot of the impact of that abuse and how it's affected us mm. through our lives. Um, I think it's a, it's a totally rounded and fair view of what really happened back in the 70s and 80s. Do you think that it might serve a greater purpose as well to perhaps help children and their parents who might be going through something similar but feel trapped, they can't say anything? Well, I certainly think from the response that I've had uh, in terms of personal messages social media messages and parents saying that they now were going to be more vigilant uh, when they drop their children off at any sort of uh, sporting setting. So I think for certain it has opened a lot of people's eyes. Um, you know, sometimes I think there's that, 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 that thought that it won't happen here or it doesn't happen here, uh, in, ha in our club or organisation. Yeah. And they, they've now realised that it can happen anywhere. And I've said how vigilant they're going to be. Yeah. Paul, can I just concentrate on, on you for a moment? Um, people will remember you, I remember you, from the FA Cup back in 1991, uh, which you won with your team Spurs. I mean, it was an incredible game. Everyone will remember it for Paul Gascoigne, one of the greatest players of all time, injuring his knee severely. And then it was sort of on your shoulders and the rest of your team to to win the day, and you scored one of the goals, the equaliser, and then you, you raised the FA Cup above your head, and everyone, no one could have guessed what you were going through, and, and everyone would have just expected you to have been on top of the world, but how was it for you? 
Uh, I mean, there, there were mo moments of elation. Uh, I've got to be honest, um, and I, I, I've quoted this often, I have the FA Cup winners medal, as you quite rightly say. I have three England caps in my home, but I don't put any of them on show because for me, looking at them just represents the, the pain and the suffering and what, what it took for me to reach that level. So uh, for that reason, uh, I don't put them on, uh, on show in my home. If we were just to go back to the beginning then, Paul, when you were a, a boy in Manchester growing up, all you wanted to be was a professional footballer. Why was it so important to you? I think when you were growing up on a council estate in, 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 in Manchester, in Withinch Hall there, it was, it was in some ways a way to, to, to get out. But I think, I think mainly it's because you watch your sporting, sporting idols and you wanted to play in front of them big crowds. It was, it was the, the only thing you ever wanted as a youngster. And I think, you know, I was no different than anyone else on, on the council estate that, that I lived on. We all had I, aspirations of, of becoming a professional footballer. And it was our only dream. I know it was my only dream ever since I could, or I began walking. I just wanted to emulate the... Uh, the players that I adored from 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 the club that I supported, and do you know, I suppose that was probably my downfall in terms of the abuse that I ended up uh, enduring because these these paedophile coaches knew that they knew that you would almost do anything uh, to realise your and, dream, and they preyed on that. And this scout who spotted you, spotted your talent. Um, he became the abuser. How did he approach you? How did he approach your family? Well, he, he approached my dad when I was playing for my school team. Um, I had heard about this team because they went on they went on overseas trips to places like America and Ireland, which were really unheard of back in the seventies. You know, and we were lucky as a family uh, if we had a day out somewhere. Uh, local or maybe stay a week in a caravan because we didn't have the, the resources nor the funds to be able to afford that. He came along, he brought gifts, not just for me, but for my family. Um, he told and, and made my parents believe that I, he could help me realise my, my dream. Uh, my parents were endeared to him purely and simply because he kept he kept telling them all the time uh, what a good player I was and how I had a great opportunity of making it. So they thought he was doing the best for me. Yeah. Uh, whilst um, when I was alone, he, he, he was a complete monster. Yeah. And how did he control you and, and the others to make sure that you didn't go to your parents and tell them? Yeah, well, uh, I guess many ways really I, I the reasons for me personally were uh, after the first time that he'd abused me he threatened to kill my brothers kill my parents if i said anything he told me it was what i had to do if i wanted to become a footballer um, i didn't want my brothers and my family not to receive the gifts that they were receiving because i knew that we couldn't afford to go out and buy them. I mean, we're talking about the latest football boots, the latest sportswear. Yeah. He even bought my parents a colour TV. Um, so, but I think the overriding, the overriding reason that I didn't speak as a child was I genuinely believed that this coach had the power to, to give and take away the only thing I ever wanted to do, and that was to be a professional footballer. Yeah. So, you know... Amongst all the reasons, the fear was that he could take my opportunity, the only thing I, I ever dreamt of, of, of and, becoming, and, to and, be a footballer. And the idea Sorry. of approaching the club itself for some help, that, that just didn't occur to you? Um, well, as I say, no, because of the, uh, the threats on the family. Yeah. Um, these people are very clever at isolating you, grooming your your family or back then it was grooming the family and leaving or, or leaving you with nowhere to turn or the feeling that you had nowhere to turn. Yeah. I mean, David will tell you, uh, I thought if I told my dad, my dad would kill him. Yeah. Um, 
and I didn't want to lose my dad. Yeah, that, that so was there some... are a lot of overarching reasons why why young children don't speak out. That, that's something we saw in the documentary, David. Uh, I'll come to you now. Um, you know, you were playing at Man City for eight years alongside Paul, uh, scoring goals, and no one would have guessed uh, what hell you would have been through as a kid to get there. Uh, well, no, um, you know, in some ways, you know, Paul, Paul and I, uh, it's often said to us how, how strong we must be to sort of come through the abuse and, and have the careers we had. But uh, I think both of us would say that we got four England caps between us. You know, we, we, we thought we were better than that, should have been better than that. You know, we, we yeah. wanted, we both of us wanted to get 50, 60 England caps. So, you know, I, I wanted to play for City forever and score a couple of hundred goals. That's what that's what I wanted. So it's, it, it is all relative. Um, but in reality, the last thing I felt as a footballer was strong. I, I, I felt so weak and, and so vulnerable. Um, and it, and it's, it, it's difficult. So I, I, kind of, I wrote a book um, a couple of years. Well, it was just being finished as 2016, November approached. And, and just telling that story, even just to myself, um, made me understand myself uh, a lot more. But you know, you're not to know. And the, the we we do from time to time. We'll do workshops with people, and you can um, you can literally sit there all afternoon and, and discuss reasons why you might not disclose abuse. For mine, uh, very much was immediately that um, you know I honestly thought my dad my dad had killed a guy, uh, and you know my dad wasn't a, a violent guy in any way. But that fear of um, as a, an 11, a 10, 11 year old kid, you, you're making a decision of, a, of an adult um, that I'm better off suffering this than losing my dad or, or putting my, my dad and my parents through this. Yeah. And those reasons for non disclosure, um, you know, they, they change through, throughout your life. Later on in life, my dad became ill. And, and, and I, again, there's always a reason why you, why you don't want to, to put that onto, onto in particular, my. my Parents split up when I was seven. Um, my dad was the football fan. My dad was the city fan, and my dad was the guy, the one that was taking me to to these games. And and for all the right reasons, um, and this is maybe the bit that parents say might might find hard to to understand. For all the right reasons, my dad was allowing me to go. You know, these some of these were not football trips. I I went to Spain uh, to Mallorca literally on a holiday. There was there was myself. Benno and one of the one of the other young players. Now, uh, would you make that decision to do that now as a parent? I, I, I hope you wouldn't. Um, unfortunately, you know, a massive percentage of parent, of uh, coaches and volunteers in all sports are, are, are absolute genuine people. But uh, it is also potentially a place where you... predatory and uh, people and, and, and paedophiles will see will see opportunities. You, you mentioned. Uh, so... I was going to say um, you mentioned the abuser Barry Burnell, one of the most prolific child abusers uh, named in the report. He was first convicted in 1994 in Florida after a 13-year-old boy and his team made allegations against him while on tour there. He's been subsequently convicted in the UK of more than 60 child sexual offences against 22 boys dating back to the 1970s. He's been tried a total of five times and is currently serving a 34-year prison sentence. And despite dozens of outstanding allegations against him, it's unlikely he'll face any further trials. Um, was it similar for you, how he approached you, how he approached your family, and a similar uh, modus operandi in terms of keeping your silence? I think, um, in, in many ways, I consider myself uh, fairly lucky. It might sound bizarre, but the... Um, I think this was my time was quite early on in 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 Bedell's, uh, uh predatory period of time, if you like. I it, it, this happened to me just on just a few occasions. Um, it was very easy for him to do it because it was literally ask you know ask my dad to um, can he come and stay at my house? There was always a good reason why I would go and stay uh, stay with him. He'd, he'd pick me up from maybe from Main Road, the football city's ground and. He'd want me to watch a particular player or team the next day, and it was always, always for the uh, the right reasons. When you when you look at what happened later on with a lot of the lads that, that were abused, it was it was really, really was well systematic in terms of 
you know, how many boys would be in his, his house at one time. And, and uh, there's a real, I hate to say, but a real sort of sophistication about them. But overall, the, uh, the overarching thing was always that um, all these guys were ambitious to, to be footballers. All the parents were ambitious and they, they would do anything. And, and they genuinely, all the parents, believed that by allowing the, 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 the kids the, the time to, to spend with Benel, um, you know, would be would be the best thing, and, and you know, there's no doubt that they were. Uh, he, you know, he was a very, very good football coach. Paul, I just want to ask you. You know, the FA knew that Barry Bennell had been convicted in 1994. Uh, another footballer, Ian Ackley, spoke about his abuse at his hands in 1996, and yet it took 20 years for the FA to commission this investigation. This could have all been uh, brought to light potentially years ago. It took it took Andy Woodward to come forward uh, in 2016. Could this have been sorted out years ago or brought to light years ago? Well, yes, there was a massive, massive opportunity missed. Um, there was an investigation of sorts. The FA were approached and chose to ignore the fact um, they knew Benel had been convicted in Florida. Yeah. So I believe that the opportunity uh, was missed uh, back in 1997 when, when Ian actually supported the youngster who came forward in America and accused Benel of, yeah. of abusing him. Um, even the media, even the media, the newspapers, they refused to report uh, on what Ian had said and, and when he'd come forward. Why do, they, you think they, they they were the, why, why do you think they were reluctant to pick it up? You're talking about probably a different era. Um, the, you know, what, what you've got to understand is these coaches uh, that were associated with clubs, they brought players to clubs that earned them money. When you certainly look at crew and look at the club I played for, Blackpool, there was two of us that went on to play for England. Um, and we were sold uh, for upwards of, of half a million back in the 80s. Now, that's a lot of money to the football clubs. Are they going to, are they going to um, dispose of coaches or, or get rid of coaches that are earning them uh, a lot of money? So I do believe that, you know, I'm not so sure the report was, was, was correct. I do believe there was evidence. The evidence that the lads from that era gave should have been enough to say that um, football did know what was happening, but just chose to, um, to sweep it under the carpet and in some ways the, for monetary reasons. The FA only commissioned the investigation and report once uh, Andy Woodward came forward, and that was in 2016. And then after Andy, I believe you came forward as well to support him. Can you tell us about how you came to make that decision? It must have been incredibly difficult after keeping all of that a secret for so long. Yeah, I, th I genuinely thought I was going to take my secret to my grave. I, I, I read Andy's um, article on a Friday and it just it was just like reading my own story and I felt compelled to to come forward and support it what I didn't what I didn't uh, think out fully was uh, because I, I, I actually contacted the uh, the journalist straight away but luckily I didn't um, I didn't go forward with the uh, the interview purely and simply because I hadn't told my wife and my children or anyone in my family. So I took the weekend to, to explain it to my, my, my wife and my children and also my mum and dad. And it was really difficult and a difficult decision, but um, I felt it was the right decision. David, is that the same for you? That when you were reading Andy Woodward, you know, you felt it was so similar to yours and it was a relief and that you, you, you needed to come forward and bolster him in a way. It, it didn't happen like that uh, in, in my case, to be honest with you. Uh, I think I said earlier, I'd, I'd, uh, my father passed away in 2010. Uh, I'd had a go at 
writing a sort of autobiography, which I picked up again in like 2015. Uh, that was being published, and, and, and I decided during the writing of that that I needed to tell the truth. I got to the age of 10 in, in, in the book and thought, if I lie now, then the whole of this book's going to be a lie. So I wrote it all down, what's and all. It was going to be, it was due for publish. Um, we had to have the final version of the book in December the 1st, 2016. Um, and obviously, uh, Andy Woodward spoke November, uh, November 16. And, and I think there was a, a journalist somewhere found found the book on Amazon. So I, I was um, kind of inundated with phone calls one day um, and realised that, you know, I, that was the time for me to make a statement. I'm, I, I, I don't think I, I would have ever had, uh, whether brave is, I, I wouldn't have done it in the same way that Andy did. I think, you know, he's incredibly brave to do that. Yeah. Um, I have no idea what would have happened had, had the book been published um, with... Um, you know whether I'd have done all the TV stuff. I, I really don't know. And and in fairness, the, the story isn't isn't as as powerful as, as Andy's. So it happened differently. Um, but, but very much immediately after that, there was a as you say, there were there were hundreds came forward, and and there was a, a lot of TV stuff was was happening then. Um, and it, it was you know it was really heartbreaking. It's still heartbaking to to watch it now. The, the guys yeah. on telly, you know, Andy. Uh, and Paul at the time, and, and this is this is um, really one of the most powerful things. When you, you know we talk about the documentary that's on that's on currently, it's a 700-page document that uh, you know very few people are going to read from cover to cover uh, or have access to read. But this this three-part documentary it, it really humanises uh, what went on uh, all those years ago and how it's still having such a, a profound effect on on these kids who are now in the, the 50s and 60s. Paul, uh, we see every week in the Premier League that they're taking racism very seriously. Uh, they are showing stands with Black Lives Matter signs, uh, shirts with Black Lives Matter signs. Um, and I'm just wondering, are we going to see some similar support for all those hundreds of children who were raped within the football infrastructure, if you like, over decades, because I haven't seen it. I, I mean, I, I, I'm not so sure that we'll see a movement of any sort. I, I, I know, and David probably knows, that we've had uh, unbelievable response to the documentary going forward. Do you know, us as individuals that went through that back in the 70s and 80s, I think we feel that this, this documentary is, is rounded and it tells the truth about what happened back then. I think, and certainly in my case, um, I want to move forward now. Um, you know, the story has been told. The nation know uh, what happened back then. Um, it gives us a chance to find some solace, move yeah. forward. I hope the other lads find yeah. some strength. But I, I, I'm not so sure that there'll be any kind of movement, movement to, um, to, to, you know, like the, 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 the Black Lives Matter or, or any of the other me movements, kick it out or whatever. Uh, and I'm not sure the lads really want that because it's a constant memory. It's a constant mm. memory. I think, I think a lot of us just want to now get on with our lives. Yeah. We have been vindicated uh, I, I was thinking... uh, about what happened to us. So, you know... Let, let's, for me personally, it's, yeah. uh, it's about moving on and, and trying to live the rest of my life. Paul and David, um, I'm sure you coming forward, telling your story, could potentially help a lot of people at home, parents, uh, children who may find themselves in a similar situation. Paul, if a, a child finds themselves in such a situation, trapped in that way, what kind of advice would you give them uh, you know, today in 2021? The only advice I'd give them is to speak to somebody, speak to a loved one, speak to uh, a parent, uh, speak to your coach um, or one of the coaches at the club. The infrastructure and the support that they have at the in the elite game now is second to none, certainly in football. 
So um, what I would, would say is speak to somebody because I wouldn't want somebody uh, somebody's life to pass them by like mine is. I'm 56 now. You know, I was 52 when I came forward. It's a lot, a lot of uh, years where I've, I've, I, I believe that I've, I've gone through um, sheer hell and I wouldn't want to wish that on any other individual. Paul Stewart and David White, thank you so much for your contributions today on The Nexus. Really appreciate it. And thank you. thank you at home and on your phones for watching. Remember, if you want to see this episode or any of our previous episodes, again, do look at our channel on YouTube. Just type in Nexus TRT World. Until next week, then, goodbye. <laughs>